All right, so let's get started. Um, first, we've got um, Rebecca speaking. So take it away, Rebecca. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for that introduction and acknowledgement of country, Stephen. Just give me two seconds and I'll share my screen. Um, <clears throat> Okay, is that sharing? Yep, can yep. see it. Oops, I've gone back to that view. Okay, um, yeah, so it's, um, it's a real pleasure to be here today um, talking about the possibilities for OER and authentic authentic assessment. As Stephen says, I'm um, based um, at the School of Education. I'm down here in Geelong at Deakin University on Wadawurrung country. And um, uh, at this time last year, I was just reflecting then, I really didn't, um, I was investigating OERs and I'd received a grant from Deakin University and I was looking ahead to trimester two with my students, my history pre-service um, teaching students and um, about to kind of dive into the world of OER and um, it was um, a very exciting time and we um, got to... Um, we achieved the intended outcome, um, which was to um, co-publish or co-author an open book. Uh, so I'll just put the link. Um, um, put the link in the chat here, so that you might would like to. Um... Yeah, we can chuck the link in there for you. Oh, okay. Oh, there it is. Thank you, Dokes. So if you wanted to open it up and have a look, that'll give you some idea of what I'm talking about. Um, so this open book, which is um, published on the Pressbooks platform, is an outcome of an assessment task. Um, so I'll just um, um, talk a little bit about the process and, and what I see as um, the benefits of uh this kind of OER work for, for assessment um, and developing digital literacy in pre-service teachers and, and um and also teachers in schools. Um, so as you can see, it's got a focus on historical thinking for senior secondary students um, and um, the 42 co-authors, um, they are composed of the students who are studying the unit and um, as well as there is um, some activities there designed by myself and my co-editor, who's um, a practicing teacher, um, as well as some of the librarians as well. Um, <clears throat> So, yeah, it, it's a, um, it collates 62 learning and teaching activities. Um, and um, the beauty of these activities is um, that they can be um, adapted to suit teachers in their contexts. Um, and they're also really great for our pre-service teachers because they can then see the different ways of interpreting the curriculum. So I'm in Victoria, so a lot of our pre-service teachers are as well, and they um, the activities focus on the Victorian curriculum of education. So it's a, an, a unit on senior secondary history. Um, but we did have students from other parts of Australia, and so um, but they're kind of um, very adaptable to and can be used to suit um, curriculum contexts in different states and territories. Um, so it's published on press books, as you can see, with the Creative Commons attribution non-commercial. Um, and we was really lucky um, um, to get a, a Deakin OER grant, um, which gave me a little bit of um, money to um, and provided some time um, to, to do this project. And also, also the Open Educational Resources Collective um, was supported the um, Deakin um, um, through access to the Pressbooks um, platform. So I'll yeah, acknowledge that. And also I'd like to acknowledge that um, this my um, pathway into this um, was largely through the Deakin Inclusive Education Community Practice. And um, a colleague from the University of Queensland presented and um, really inspired me about the possibilities of doing renewable assessment in creating and publishing work with, with pre-service teachers. Um, so I'll just tell you a little bit um, more about the process. Um, we're kind of thinking about it in terms of um, pedagogy and assessment today. And um, 
so for me, the big change that I needed to undertake in my unit was um, translating my existing assessment tasks um, from what we might describe as disposable assessment tasks into renewable assessment tasks. Um, and, you know, I think the, the image of the desktop bin there um, encapsulates where a lot of um, university students' assessment often ends up um, in our desktop bins or remains hidden away on, in computer files. Um, you know, once we've, you know, what, what's the mark? What did I get? Okay. And um, that's a real loss for pre-service um, teachers because they've often created great learning activities and then they forget to come back with, with, um, to them or they, or they don't get the chance to share them with their peers or share them um, with their teachers when they're out in schools. And so I'm drawing there on, the, on Riley's work on renewable assessment tasks, um, which have the aim of supporting students' individual learning, but instead of being disposed of, um, parts of the task get get transferred into openly licensed material okay and I would emphasize parts of the task so there was a whole lot of um, other parts of the task that required critical reflection um, and uh, on OER enabled pedagogy um, but the the part of the task that was extracted was just one or two activities which you can see there in the book now so um, and the idea of a renewable assessment aligns with OER enabled pedagogy, which is basically um, making good use of the five R's permissions. And I think um, they were some of the things that were covered in last week's um, webinar. So I, I won't go over those now. There's heaps of great material out there on that. Um, so I'll just speak a little bit more to our process. Um, so part of the work I had to do in um, revising and renewing this unit was building in OER enabled pedagogy into the design of the unit um, and in doing so um, myself and my pre-service teachers were really able to reflect on the educational value of OER so um, you know we talked a lot about equity and access um, you know the fact that these are we're able to access as well as create free resources um, and so on. And that also led to some interesting discussions about the ethical impl implications of being, you know, um, rather than consumers, um, um, pre-service teachers were um, seeing themselves as makers and sharers of educational resources. Um, and in doing that, they had to, I guess, learn the rules of Creative Commons licensing, um, which also included how to find, evaluate and create OERs. So for us working in history education, there was a lot of work um, around visual images and sources were, and um, were a lot of the ones that they were needing to put into their um, the activities that they were designing. But they were also quite excited um, <clears throat> Yeah, about the sort of, I guess, the sort of subversive possibilities of doing this kind of work as well. They've sort of felt quite empowered and like the idea that they might be pushing back a little bit against that neoliberal paradigm of publishing and um, and and having some control of their own professional knowledge and, and sharing that as well in a really um, open and, and generous way. And throughout this process, we had, we had a lot to learn, but were really ably supported by an excellent team um, at Deakin. And so we um, had three librarians supporting us, um, including Angie Williams, who might be here, who's the Open Education Librarian, um, and a couple of other librarians that really helped um, to create some um, resources that our students could use on finding, evaluating, creating OIRs. And we have a really fantastic copyright team and um, really couldn't have done it with us without them because they really taught us a lot along the way and also helped us, um, you know, double checking our attributions um, and, and making sure that the materials were, oops, we were creating were compliant. Um, and also, um, I had a VCE history teacher who was working with me and they acted um, primarily as a um, peer reviewer um, and also um, contributed to co-editing and creating um, uh, an activity. So that's that's us. Um, we look very excited in that photo um, there, um, because it's the day of the launch and that's um, to, uh, to my right, that's Philip, the um, VCE history teacher and a few of our students who actually spoke at the launch. Um, at the end of the year. 
And so really, you know, uh, the whole project was um, supported um, fundamentally by the engagement and enthusiasm of pre-service teachers. So they showed to me that there's um, a real appetite that, um, for developing these skills. And I should just say, we also tried to work with um, teachers in schools, but being, you know, um, post COVID and um, there were also limitations on going into schools. We ideally, the project was to work alongside groups of teacher expert groups as well, but just because of the pressures teachers were facing last year and continue to, we weren't able to sort of build that into schools, but that's something that I would really like to see happening in the future. Um, so just here, you know, there's a couple of quotes um, and you can read um, in the introduction, there's actually an introduction in the book that's um, written by our pre-service teachers. Um, and there's, um, as you can see, so um, Nicolette and, and Nick, who were in the image before, they say it's freely accessible and adaptable resources. Creating an OAR was a great opportunity to develop our emergent teacher identities, progress our teaching expertise and interact with the prescribed curriculum in order to develop meaningful classroom skills, um, which I was pretty happy with <laughs> as a teacher educator. Um, they also say allowing us to model compliance as best practice for future students was important um, and go on to say this fantastic opportunity developed our practical teaching skills and engaged, engaged us as members of a broader learning community by developing the activity with the knowledge it would go towards a wider educational project. Um, and, you know, that's not necessarily things students feel in as they're doing their teacher education courses, that they are part of that community um so that's that's a really great outcome um and that's also um highlighted by the um the idea that it goes somewhere is highlighted by the second comment from the student below the oar focus was engaging and the chance to have our assignments become something more than just a study exercise was an exceptional opportunity um so i think that really highlights some of the um benefits um so I, I think it sort of started to show the, the way that um, this can encourage us to rethink pedagogical approaches, um, you know, in ways that enable um, us in teacher education and probably lots of other parts of schools and, um, and higher education to engage with, um, you know, critically engage with educational issues, access and equity, for example, building digital literacy in critical um, ways. Um, you know, there's a lot of um, concerns. When I first um, initiated this project, my colleagues were like, oh, you're gonna have students copying and you're gonna have plagiarism, but I think it tackles academic integrity and plagiarism head on and, and builds those schools and skills um, and so on. And um, another thing to highlight there, student agency, it's really, um, fostering collegiality and generosity, um, which I think is a great thing for our, our teachers to go out in schools uh, with. And, you know, like I mentioned before, when the students thought they were being a bit subversive, it, it it's, um, challenges established power relations of knowledge production, um, which is really important, you know, at a time in education where we have a lot of talk about providing quality curriculum resources and, and the standardization of those curriculum resources and standardized lesson plans, um, you know, it provides an equitable model for doing that as opposed to different things like teachers pay teachers um, and other things like that. Anyway, I won't get on to that. That's a whole uh, another point. Um, but it's very, you know, obviously it's really student-centred learning and there'd be ways to hand it over, you know, more parts of the process to the students. Um, and, you know, hopefully they are modelling that, that student agency with their students as, as um, when they go out into schools. Um, hopefully you can you can see and start to appreciate that it is a, it's an example of authentic learning because in this case of teacher education, it's really developing career-specific skills which is really, you know, um, suitable to what we're doing in history education. And um, oh, there's a typo, they're, they're leaning, their learning becomes a resource for the peers. And I think that fits into the next point, which is a for, about formative assessment. So, um, you know, it feeds forward to the next cohort of students. Um, so it'd be great to do this project again, because we have the book and we can say, all right, you're going to create something. It's going to be slightly, you know, it's going to be different. Um, but, you know, that's, that, that um, 
cycle of formative assessment and feedback as they're doing it um, and then in the longer term as well. Um, and of course, you know, it's really great in terms of employability. Um, if I was a principal and a pre-service teacher comes in and tells me that they can, um, they can do this, they can lead this in their schools, um, I think I'd be pretty impressed. And of course, it aligns with things like the or teaching standards and gives them, a, you know, an innovative model for professional learning um, that, that can be really teacher-centred as well. Um, and so finally, just finishing up, um, just reflecting on some of the benefits and the barriers, I've hopefully highlighted some of the, the benefits and you can read a bit more in the front matter of the book of, of what they those are. But I think, you know, for me, the process um, was really about collaboration and collectivity in a way that I hadn't experienced in, in many other units that I've taught. So it was that sense of collaboration with the students, but also my colleagues at Deakin um, in, in the copyright and library teams, but also this wider network of OER um, people. Um, and yeah, and I think one of the benefits is the adaptability of these materials. Okay, it's not just like a quick fix of getting resources out there. Um, you know, it's, um, they're very adaptable to the context um, of, of individual schools and teachers and classrooms. There's heaps of support and opportunities and also um, particularly opportunities for further research. Um, for me, some of the barriers are costs and time. So I was lucky that I did have a grant. I don't have a grant this year. So I'm really thinking about, okay, how do I streamline the, the process? And so it'd be great to see universities investing in these initiatives to kickstart these things. Um, and, you know, I think the current condition in, in schools at the moment, it, it, as I mentioned before, it meant we weren't able to engage with teachers through this particular project. But I think um, teachers are sharing content and activities, but don't necessarily yet have the five R's kinds of skills. Um, and I think, you know, universities or higher education has those resources to build some of those pathways um, to assist school communities develop some of those skills. Uh, so yeah, um, I'll, I'll, I'll finish up there. Thank you so much for that, Rebecca. Um, there's some comments in the chat about uh, people loving how much the students are involved in that process, um, a process that maybe they traditionally don't have that much direct involvement in. And also some comments about how portable this, you know, it's it's not difficult for people to just pick it up and go in, in the curriculum. So um, there's a lot of appreciation, I think, for that aspect of your talk. Um, so thank you for that, Rebecca. And next up, we've got Linda Guthrie from the Barton Secondary College in uh, South Australia. And Linda's going to do her talk in the form of a recording, um, but is also live here to um, answer any questions afterwards as well. So uh, go for it, Linda. Uh, thank you, Stephen. And thank you for inviting me to take part in this webinar. In my conversation with you today, I'm presenting my own views and I'm not representing my workplace or employer or any of the associations that I have active membership in. Working in schools, I've been really curious about possibilities for collaboration within and across schools to develop open education resources. And I met Stephen through the OER Collective Community Day in March this year. That session really broadened my understanding of the work underpinning the creation of an OER. And what I also came to understand through speaking with Stephen is that there are really valuable opportunities to learn from and team with experts in tertiary education. So I'll just start my presentation now. Linda, you may need to click the audio share for that one. Oh, I'm really sorry. I did so well in our practice. <laughs> I've mucked it up now. Yes, there we go. Oh, 
I would like to acknowledge the country from where I bring this presentation to you today, the lands of the Ghana people. I acknowledge and pay respect to the past, present and emerging traditional custodians and elders of this nation and the continuation of cultural, spiritual and educational practices of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. I thought I'd start today with the role of teacher librarians in schools. Teacher librarians are uniquely qualified as teachers and information specialists. They bring to their role their current knowledge of the school curriculum and pedagogy and combine this with library and information management knowledge and skills. Teacher librarians offer services and programs that encompass the development of literacies in information, digital, media, literature and reading. Their teaching is generally across the curriculum, whether that be working collaboratively with a teacher or team, with subject or class teachers, or as the sole teacher of a class in the library. The teacher librarian role encompasses collection development using professional knowledge and expertise in the organisation, selection and deselection of high quality and diverse resources that support the curriculum. Teacher librarians ensure equity of access to physical and digital resources that are responsive to the needs of the learners in the school community. The school library represents a valuable asset to a school, including financially. The responsibility of management and ensuring equitable access to resources is delegated to teacher librarians and library staff. The teacher librarian is responsible for documenting the collection policy that guides the processes that determine the selection and deselection of items available through the library collection. That policy is underpinned by excellent practice in librarianship alongside the school sector guidelines that are in place for the selection and using of resources that support teaching and learning. Selection principles documented in the policy include the criteria for acquiring a range of formats for information and including them in the library collection. Teacher librarians are constantly freshening the school collection, inserting expertly selected information sources for a context where diverse learning, linguistic, cultural, social, religious, socio-economic and developmental backgrounds are the norm. The strength of the digital presence of school libraries became evident during the COVID pandemic when students were learning from home. We know digital textbooks are costly for schools, with licensing often attached to each student and renewed each year. As school budgets are often under stress or facing significant reductions and expenditure on online texts and databases are steadily increasing, there is a strong incentive for teachers and teacher librarians to look for free sources to meet the needs of the curriculum and supplement library collections. Additionally, schools are seeking ways to facilitate the integration of interactive games, videos or simulations to increase student engagement or resolve any gaps in content at a local level. School library staff enable and manage the access to open education resources through curating content and making it available through pathfinders, libguides and links on the library website or school intranet, school website or library OPAC. A key role is guiding teachers and students in the ethical use of openly licensed content for their teaching and learning. A common perception amongst students is that free sources will not require attribution, so information literacy workshops and class or individual research support for students in using information ethically are essential. Students and teachers actively seek and use open source materials such as images, video, workshops, music and teaching materials. While there are a range of free sources available for teachers and students to access, it is timely to consider taking it to the next level. Being free to reuse, remix, redistribute and adapt education resources without risking a breach of copyright exceptions and copyright license rules is really useful for teachers and students. There is an opportunity here to increase the quality of learning resources and the development of innovative pedagogy. It can seem daunting to begin using open source ebooks and textbooks, searching for suitable texts of high quality that support the curriculum in primary and secondary school can be really challenging. 
Teachers are looking for engaging and relevant resources that align with the Australian curriculum. So while we are seeing a positive approach to sharing and building knowledge, and a positive approach to accessing open source textbooks and books that support the curriculum, there is further development needed in revising job descriptions and teacher workloads to support their creation of these open texts. The significant time and workload requirements for open education resource creation will necessitate a well-communicated commitment from school leadership and from leaders in school sectors. Following on from the OER Collective Community Day, I found myself thinking, what if? What if schools used the 2019 UNESCO recommendations to support the creation of resources like open textbooks and open ebooks? This may be through adapting open education resources or creating original work. Building awareness and capacity for creating open education resources for teaching and learning would enable teachers to better leverage the benefits of using texts in their subject area or for their class. These texts could support any year level and range from phonics through to physics. The creation of texts by teachers also presents as an area of authentic learning for their students who can contribute to the creation of the texts. This in turn would provide real-world opportunities for students to assess their application of appropriate practices that recognise intellectual property and the degree to which they considered the local, social and cultural context that shaped the creation of the work. In this way, the students really have the opportunity to embed those information literacy skills and media literacy skills. And then, what if those resources were easily searchable? not just within the school through the library catalogue, but more widely. School libraries access catalogue records via SCIS, the school's catalogue information service. So what if SCIS made available open education resources catalogued and available for sharing more widely across schools? For schools, this would be cost-free. In primary and secondary schools, there is a long history of students creating print books mm -hmm that reflect their learning and their local context. Assessment tasks commonly require students to create a book to show evidence of their learning. While these are sometimes created using paper templates, increasingly the books are created using apps or websites. The books created are not readily shared. What if students created or co-created open education resources in preference to using websites and apps with their associated costs and limitations. What if there was co-construction of texts that supported First Nations learners in remote areas of Australia? What if the local environment, language and understandings were recognised in their learning materials that supported their curriculum? Anecdotally, I am aware that primary and secondary teachers have a preference for using resources that they create themselves for their classes or resources that they have collaborated in creating. There is an emerging and positive opportunity here for wider collaboration between primary or secondary educators and tertiary educators. There is a need for evidence as to what will work well with primary and secondary schools. The library's research group at Charles Sturt University conduct research that embraces all library sectors, including school libraries. There is an opening here for collaboration that will see library collections and the resourcing of school curriculum developed and enhanced. Studies in teaching and teacher librarianship provide assessment tasks that support the creation of teaching and learning materials for students in primary or secondary schools. This is an opportunity for a higher education students to initiate or broaden their professional networks by electing to work with teacher librarians and or class teachers to collaboratively create relevant and useful learning materials. Additionally, through their assignment, tertiary students may engage with the Australian Professional Standards for Teachers as an avenue for demonstrating their professional practice. For schools and universities, the invitation to look at the development of teaching material through a different lens is a catalyst for change. There is a real potential here to inspire and activate 
innovative pedagogy. The conversation is just beginning. For schools, there is a need for evidence that shows that the creation and use of open education resources leads to better outcomes for students. Teacher librarians are available to collaborate and support undertaking research. Library associations can be a contact point for reaching out to the school communities and inviting participation, whether it be for research or for co-creation opportunities. Thanks for that, Linda. Um, I see so much. Uh, I see so much synergy between, you know, both both your talks, uh, you, you and Rebecca, and the areas that you work in. And I think that's a really interesting theme. And admittedly, I think you know, in previous webinars and in OER discussions, school school classrooms and libraries haven't necessarily been at the forefront of those discussions, but I think it could mm. be could be a bit of a game changing partnership, you know, if at the institutional level we mm. set up some some serious partnerships and programs. So um I think there'll there's a lot of uh food for thought. So we can start our um discussion now. So anybody is welcome to ask questions either in the chat or you can turn your mic and video on and ask that way as well. Quite a few people have commented in the chat. I wonder if some of you want to expand on your comments, perhaps James, if 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 you if you would like to say anything about the themes you've raised in the chat. Um, sure, thanks. Um, and I, I love the idea, Stephen, that you um, reached out to the school community because it is for me not like a, it, we, we've got traction on the open education thing in the university system only very early but i was just thinking that and that was my last comment that if you got if schools use the activities um that you've presented rebecca and if teacher librarians did the sorts of things that linda's talking about and where you know then you then you get teachers on board you know and then as you get teachers on board you get students on board um and then you start to get this whole culture that really does value uh, the the knowledge commons which is what we're introducing them to and hoping that one and and hoping that one day they will contribute but the great thing is today they can start that contribution really early and um if they come in with that kind of exposure to that mindset, it doesn't mean they have to, but exposure to that mindset, I think when they come to university, um, then we can just go so much further with them because of what I find at, at the tertiary level is I'm having to do the basic kind of literacy stuff uh, around licensing and things like that with them and they're hearing it for the first time, which, yeah, I just, uh, so it excites me that, to think that you guys are, getting that message out and um uh in in that in that school community so thank you um and i don't want to derail the conversation with a sort of rant about non-commercial but um licensing but yeah as far as i know it's not it's not allowed on uh wikipedia um and I'm, there's philosophical arguments back and forth but i just am seeing quite a bit of non-commercial licensing of open textbooks that worries me a little bit because there's such good value in that and if there's any limits on its use then there's a risk that that sort of branch withers you know like people who publish books most things are one edition and they go out of print and and the, the book literally withers i mean there might be an electronic copy somewhere so if things aren't maximally openly licensed to maximize their potential utility um then that's just a strategic error unless it really is unless that license really really is what you need and i know there's reasons why um but um 
yeah, so I would use Creative Commons attribution or public domain CC0 unless there's a really, really good reason that you don't want to do that to maximise the materials utility. Anyway, there you go. That's a really great point, James, and something I'll yeah take back to our team at Deakin to discuss as we yeah move forward. And, and just oh, just to add to that point about collaborating with teachers, um, I think you know there's that would be a great model if you, and this is what we we tried to set up with this project is that we would be working with small groups of teachers who could provide contextual kind of. Uh, understanding and say this is what our students need at the moment and then the pre-service teachers could kind of um, you know um, build on those insights and and then co-create um, uh, activities with the teachers so there's definitely I think heaps of scope to do that um, but you know just being aware at the, at the moment there's so many pressures on teachers but um, hopefully you know there's is greater time to do that kind of work. Yep, Adrian. Um, I just had a question uh, with regards to the, the history book and um, the students um, contributing to that. What sort of scaffolding did you have in place so that students um, understood Creative Commons licensing and they understood the ramifications of their decision to openly license? Um, this is where we had really good support but from the librarians and the copyright teams. Um, first of all, the students were invited, you know, they, there was um, no expectation that they had to participate. So it was optional. So they all did the same assessment task. And one way we, we got them to signal whether or not they would like um, to then take the next step um, um, to have it published under the Creative Commons license, and they would signal that by putting um, um, a Creative Commons license within their assessment task. Um, and so, yeah, it was in, it was invitation. There was never any expectations. There were a few students who decided not to, um, and I think it was partly a bit of confidence as well. They didn't think that their work was good enough to put out there and share. Um, and I guess I, I I'd known from previous groups that I, I had faith that their work was going to be good enough um, uh, to share and to be useful to their peers and to their you know their in-service um, teaching peers but yeah we did a lot of work around the ethics and some great resources were made by the copyright team and the library team as well because i suppose that part of the um part of the question that i always ask educators around this is um is acknowledging that even if students do have that agency and autonomy they are invited to share whether or not you felt that there was still um that there is a power distance or a, or an unequal power differential between lecturer and students and whether or not you think that students do feel as though they should license mm. or mm. do you do you think that um do you think that most of the students um felt empowered to go either way look i can only gauge from the feedback we had two cohorts of students um a you know face-to-face on-campus cohort and an online cohort so it was a little harder to sense um what the online students thought because there was sort of um i guess less discussion but i i felt that there was um from the online students, there was greater engagement there. But I think if doing this again later in the year with the unit, I think those kinds of questions, um, you know, will come to the fore because we'll be also saying, well, this is what the students did last year and it might make them feel more, you know, pressured to participate. Um, and I think that's something we need to build into, into those discussions. Um, a little bit more um, and it's not it's when they look at their assessment criteria you know it, it's not tied to what they're assessed on um, and they also have the opportunity to do some critical reflection and they um, within their assessment task on the you know the benefits and limitations of OER so they, they have that space to be critical there but no I think that's um yeah an important point though those power differentials Adrian. 
And I just had one last question, which was about, um, have you had any conversations with students or at least any feedback from students about how authentic assessment is potentially um, supporting employability, whether or not um, there's any discussion of students including this kind of work in a portfolio or if they've raised this sort of stuff um, at, during an interview or any, or any other similar situations? Um, in their discussions, they seem to think that, it, you know, there was really potential to do that. They also do um, the graduate teacher assessment that um, at the end of their teaching degrees, and this is something that provides some evidence to demonstrate some of the standards. Um, uh, and I've tried to keep track. I'm not, this wasn't a research project. It was just doing it for the first time. So, I, you know, um, in the longer term, I would like to set it up um, as a research project to be able to, you know, um, interview students, you know, pre, during and, and post process. But um, at the moment, students are really, um, you know, it's, it's hard to keep track of where they finish, whether some of them have gone out into schools. Um, and I, they also, as soon as they leave Deakin, they lose their Deakin email. So I also at the end of last year, try and say, look, I'd love to hear how you go. Um, um, out there in schools and collecting their um, emails. But at the moment, that's just kind of an, in an informal anecdotal way. But I think there's, you know, that's the next step. There needs to be some, um, some research um, around this. Thanks very much. I just wanted to say as well that the the open text, I've already sent that to a few of our lecturers who teach um, history uh, within our um, School of Education. Uh, they've already published an, an open text. They're looking to do another, but um, I have shared that one with them um, in the hopes of showing them that there's you know other people in the same discipline doing similar work. So thanks very much for sharing. Oh, thanks. It'd be great to connect with them. And I wonder if I could just build on that um, about those possibilities of supplying that information to SKIS so that anything that is created in the university space that lends itself to primary or secondary education has that opportunity to be available directly to school libraries because that might be another way that we can really build this conversation. So one of the things I've noticed is that understanding of the difference between something being free, but you can't change it, and something being free and you can change it, is where we've got those possibilities. Because there is a lot of free material around, but not a lot of free material that we can actually adapt and reuse and, and make really relevant on a local level. So being able to include photos of the students in a book or photos of the local memorials rather than memorials from the United States really makes a difference to how relevant the learning feels for students. I was going to ask uh, one of the teacher librarians, uh, Bianca, to comment on the you know, the workload stuff and the you know rethinking roles stuff. But I think she's just left. But I know there are a few teacher librarians or people who have worked in schools in in the webinar here today. Did any of you or Linda again want to comment on you know uh, what is what is the role of uh, teacher librarians or rethinking those roles in relation to um, open educational practices or adopting OER or anything? I guess one thing that all teachers and teacher librarians know is that everyone is a content creator. It's what all the teachers do. And it's what teacher librarians do. Where it's really changed is that we're also expected now to be content creators, graphic designers, have amazing presentations. And then it's what do we do with that particular item? So knowing that that item is 
good enough to be shared more widely, knowing that there's a way to share it, and giving other schools and teachers the opportunity to build on what you have to make it even better for their local environment is, is a way we can value add to teaching. I know it sounds a little bit like everyone's got the same textbook, but where it's different with open education resources is you might have started with the same germ of an idea, but being able to really adapt it to your students, to your school, to the changing elements of the curriculum, because it does change. Even the Australian curriculum has had adjustments and things come in and things go out. That really boosts the opportunity to have very relevant, high quality resources for our classes and for our students. So um, the workload issue is, is a really critical one. And I think is related to those job descriptions. So the possibility might be that down the track, as in the university sector, we have specialised roles that are about those open education resources, or it might be a particular um, role that one of the school services officers undertake in terms of the actual creation of the uh, open education resources. And the teachers and teacher librarians have that role of checking for the quality and checking for the attribution. So I think there's lots of ways we can get around this because already the workload is not sustainable for teachers. And part of that is about everyone creating their own content. Last call for questions before we finish. Stephen, can I just add to mm -hmm. one of Linda's points? Um, yeah. I really think, yeah, she hit the nail on the head there. It, it's, um, there's a lot of talk at the moment about sort of policy solutions of standardised curriculum resources and standardised lesson plans. And um, OER supports, you know, teachers and students in providing resources, but it does so in a way, like you've just said, that it's, you know, it's flexible. It shows the infinite ways that curriculum can be interpreted. Um, but it, it, it it's gives them something to work with um, and so and builds in that flexibility for like what Linda said for those localized contexts as well mm. so that's I think the really exciting thing mm. thanks for those points um Kate it, Kate Lafferty it looked like you were about to say something did you want to pitch in I was just going to type it. I was just going to say thank you um, for the presentation today. I'm assessment is my area of research and developmental assessment. So some of the very traditional assessments um, do my head in a little bit and I'm new to OER. So thank you because you've just um, completely opened uh, and blown kind of the ceiling off um, opportunities. So uh, thank you very much for that. Um, I am curious about some of the then the measurement aspects behind having these tasks as assessments. Um, so I don't know if you've got time for chats later on about that um, or if there's somewhere I can access it. I'm just really keen, just out of interest more than anything, to, um, to have a look at that flip side so not so much the oer side but the assessment side of the discussion so thank you both yeah kate i'd be more than happy to talk through that like i mentioned before it was just it's one part of the assessment task so if you wanted to have a look at the task and the assessment rubric i'd be more than happy to share that that'd be awesome thank you <laughs> Yeah, and Kate, there is increasingly some uh, published research on this topic in Australia. Um, as usual, a lot of it coming out of Uni of SQ. Um, and I see you're at La Trobe, so I'll be in touch and maybe we can have a chat about that stuff. Thanks for yeah. pitching in. Thanks.
And um, yeah, thanks everyone for coming today. And if you can put your hands together for Linda and Re Rebecca, um, really fascinating talks. And I think it's just the start of a conversation really that's happening today. And I'm um, looking forward to continuing that. So um, thanks to both of you. And to everyone, uh, just a reminder that uh, next week, uh, I'm just putting a link in the chat to upcoming meetings of this community. Next week, we have a community meeting on April the 4th at 1 o'clock AEST, so that's next Tuesday. And then we'll have another webinar on a, a topic <laughs> next month. Um, so keep in touch and subscribe to the website to uh, get emails about what we are up to. So thanks everyone and see you next time.